from the pen of Thomas Jefferson, June 20th, 1803, to Meriwether Lewis Esquire, captain of the 1st Regiment of Infantry of the United States of America. The object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and such principal stream of it as by its course and communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean, whether the Columbia, Oregon, Colorado, or any other river may offer the most direct and practicable water communication across this continent for the purpose of commerce. It was a mission of incomprehensible weight, a calling beyond all others. This was a letter written by President Thomas Jefferson to his dear friend and secretary, Meriwether Lewis. The purpose was to explain the goal of the most famous expedition in United States history. These are the lives of famous adventurers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. I'm Vanessa Richardson. And I'm Carter Roy. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Historical Figures, you can find them on Apple Podcasts. Tune in, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast directory. And if you like the show, we'd really appreciate a five-star review. Yeah, it seems simple, but it really helps us keep the show going. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and on Twitter at Parcast Network. Don't forget to subscribe because a new episode comes out every Wednesday. Although this letter was addressed to one man, the journey would require two leaders and a crew of men with undeniable strength, stamina, and a diverse skill set. The crew would be called the Corps of Discovery, and its mission was a joint effort spearheaded by the incomparable wilderness duo known as Lewis and Clark. And a duo they were. It's true, there's no Lewis without Clark, and vice versa. The men combine their complementary personalities and talents to lead a highly successful expedition that would solidify U.S. territory and establish notable trade routes. From May 1804 to September 1806, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark led a crew of over 30 men on a momentous journey, which began near St. Louis and went far west all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And they did this without any modern form of GPS. That's right. Imagine if you can a group of men using only devices such as the sextant, which measures the angular distance between two objects, and the quadrant, which measures altitude, as well as a standard compass to determine their position. Now, even though we often don't hear one name without the other, Lewis and Clark were individuals who led separate lives before and after the expedition. Of course, they were known for their trek throughout the western frontier of the United States. But we must explore what shaped them in order to understand how they could work together to accomplish such an incredible feat and help change the course of America forever. Let's begin with the man hand-picked by Thomas Jefferson himself. Meriwether Lewis was born August 18, 1774, just two years before the American Revolution, at his family's Virginia estate, Locust Hill. His father, William, was a military man, and his mother, Lucy, was an esteemed cook and herbalist. For those who aren't familiar with the term, an herbalist is someone who studies herbs and plants for medicinal purposes. A much more holistic approach to medicine and health. Lucy's culinary expertise and charming disposition made her known and liked throughout the land. In fact, the entire Lewis clan was held in high regard, especially by another Virginia family known as the Jeffersons. That would be the family of Thomas Jefferson, who was actually 31 years older than Meriwether Lewis. Lewis and his family were very close to the Jeffersons, and this connection would continue throughout Lewis's life and lead to Lewis's involvement in the famous expedition in the first place. But before the journey that would become his magnum opus, Lewis would experience the trials of both death and revolution. In 1779, his father William passed away when Lewis was just five years old. William caught pneumonia while crossing a freezing river on his way home on leave from the military. Lewis's mother, Lucy, however, remarried a year later and relocated the entire family to Georgia. It was here that Lewis became a skilled hunter and outdoorsman. In fact, there were several times when he would sneak out in the middle of the night during frigid winters, accompanied only by his dogs to go hunting. And he was only eight years old. That's right. 
He also developed an affinity for natural history, and, taking after his mother, would also collect wild herbs and flowers to learn about their various uses. This would become extremely important years later, as his interest in botany would lead to several discoveries during the expedition. When he was about 13 years old, Lewis grew tired of Georgia and moved back to Virginia to get an education and learn how to help manage his family's estate. He was quite successful at estate management, actually doubling the size of the estate. But soon after, he would be called to other pursuits. In 1794, President George Washington organized troops of 13,000 men to help squelch what was known as the Whiskey Rebellion. This was an uprising that began in 1791 when Alexander Hamilton, yes, the one made famous by the acclaimed musical, proposed a tax on liquor. But Americans living on the western frontier were outraged and eventually mobilized, forcing President Washington himself to actually lead the United States militia to Pittsburgh. It was in Pittsburgh that rebels had violently torched the home of the tax collection supervisor, John Neville. Lewis, at the ripe age of 20, was one of these militiamen sent to stop the rebels. Washington squelched the revolt within no time at all. As soon as the rebels heard Washington and his men were approaching, they dispersed and disappeared. Lewis liked this small taste of military life, and so he decided to remain as a volunteer, eventually joining a force responsible for maintaining peace between various American Indian tribes and settlers on the frontier. While serving, he met another soldier by the name of William Clark. And although they didn't serve together long, they developed a deep respect for one another. I can venture to say that it may have been the start of a beautiful bromance. Perhaps. But Clark had to resign from the military due to some health issues and family matters. Lewis, on the other hand, was promoted to captain. Within a year, he was asked by newly elected president Thomas Jefferson, his family friend, to become his private secretary and personal aide. But Lewis could not anticipate what this would actually mean and where it would have him headed. As for the man who would become his adventuring counterpart, William Clark was born on August 1st, 1770 in Caroline County, Virginia. He was the ninth of 10 children born to John and Ann Rogers Clark. His family braved the edges of the frontier, living in a region as far as settlers were willing to go, considering the frontier was still known to be dangerous and unpredictable. Despite their rugged lifestyle, Clark and his family made sure to participate in some of the more genteel activities of the community. Fox hunts, cockfights, shooting tournaments, and even formal balls. Um, cockfights? Those were considered genteel? Mm, it was a different time. Clark was born into a family of military men. His five older brothers fought in the Revolutionary War, and one of them, George Rogers Clark, became a war hero and the epitome of the determined patriot. In 1784, the Clarks moved even farther west to Louisville, Kentucky. Here, there wasn't much formal education to be had, so Clark missed out on the more intellectual pursuits of adolescence. His lack of schooling is apparent in his writings, as he was known to have many typos and misspellings in his letters and journal entries. Following the footsteps of his older brothers, Clark enlisted in the Army in 1789 when he was 19 and two years later served under General Charles Scott's command against the American Indians in St. Clair's incursion. This battle would go down in history as one of the worst for American troops in the Indian Wars, and the absolute best for the Western Confederacy of American Indians. The war party of the Miami, Shawnee, and Lenape tribes numbered more than a thousand, which was slightly more than the American troops led by General Arthur St. Clair. But it wasn't the higher number of warriors that did the trick. The American Indians utilized strategies that were unfamiliar to American soldiers, like ambush. They did this at break of day, taking General St. Clair's troops by complete surprise. Only 24 Americans escaped. Because of this military debacle, President George Washington made General St. Clair resign, and Congress began looking into the effectiveness of Washington's leadership. It was four years later that Clark, now about 25 years old, was transferred to another unit and became lieutenant. This is where he met Meriwether Lewis, but like we mentioned, Clark retired from the military in 1796. However, Lewis and Clark remained friends and corresponded with each other from time to time. But at this point, neither was aware of the bond that would develop due to unforeseen opportunities. 
Flash forward to 1803. The land of North America beyond the Mississippi was at stake. Spain, France, England, and Russia all laid claim to an area of it. But Jefferson wanted to jump at the opportunity to claim as much as he could of it. In his eyes, the unknown could no longer remain unknown. He wanted to follow the rivers to the Pacific Ocean and plant the American flag, so to speak. After a chunk of land was traded to France from Spain in 1802, Jefferson decided to pounce. French leader Napoleon Bonaparte was willing to sell the land for two main reasons. First, he feared that keeping it would result in a conflict with the United States at some point, which he wanted to avoid. Second, he realized that the land would strengthen the U.S. and its commerce, making it a powerful force against England, a country which both America and France despised. And so the Louisiana Territory, roughly 827,000 square miles of land west of the Mississippi River, was sold to the U.S. for $15 million. Jefferson's first order of business was to organize an expedition to establish America's trade routes in the territory. But the expedition would encompass much more than that. This was uncharted land, so it was also a mission of research. What plants, animals, people inhabited this area? To lead this expedition, Jefferson looked no further than his right-hand man. But he informed Lewis that because the mission would be an enormous undertaking, he would need to recruit a co-leader. On June 19, 1803, 29-year-old Lewis wrote to 33-year-old Clark, offering him the position. Then, on July 29th, Clark's reply arrived. Quote, My friend, I assure you no man lives with whom I would prefer to undertake such a trip as yourself. That was Clark's response, full of admiration and consent. So there you have it. This was the beginning of Lewis and Clark. As for who would do what, Lewis had the most weight on his shoulders. In addition to commanding the expedition, he was tasked with making scientific discoveries, establishing a feasible path for American commerce, and developing diplomacy with the various American Indian tribes. But Lewis was also very well educated and a strong writer. He would craft the clearest picture of the voyage through his numerous journal writings, which were supplemented by Clark's accounts of events. Clark's primary role, on the other hand, was to serve as chief cartographer. Yes, he was the map maker. And a vital piece of the puzzle. And so was his partner Lewis, despite his personal struggles. According to historian William Least Heatmoon, Lewis was the most fascinating and complex member of the expedition. He has said that Lewis was, quote, a man fraught with serious emotional problems, but also a man of great character, great integrity, truly marvelous, insightful leadership, but a man who continually was on the edge of falling off of the abyss of good, sane control. Yes, he was known to be a bit moody. And this would actually surface during the expedition. Lewis suffered from bouts of depression. Thomas Jefferson even said that Lewis was, quote, prone at times to sensible depressions of the mind. So it wasn't a secret, but sadly at the time, physicians had little understanding of the causes or treatments of mental illness. So those who experienced these mental ailments suffered without many options for reprieve. This may have explained why Lewis was more of a lone wolf when it came to relationships, never settling down with one woman. Clark, on the other hand, was more congenial and a bit of a ladies' man who ended up marrying twice. In terms of the differing personalities of Lewis and Clark, according to historian Stephen Ambrose, quote, in general, in areas in which Lewis was shaky, Clark was strong, and vice versa. Most of all, Lewis knew that Clark was competent to the task, that his word was his bond, that his back was steel. Clark knew the same about Lewis. Their trust in each other was complete, even before they took the first step west together, end quote. They were a perfect balance for each other, a veritable yin and yang, The solid foundation that Lewis and Clark provided for the expedition and their crew was vital to its success. So who were the others that comprised this crew known as the Corps of Discovery? They were generally volunteers who had heard about the exciting operation commissioned by President Jefferson. These were men who desired adventure and, of course, were intrigued by the risks and possibilities of such an undertaking. From a recruitment standpoint, Lewis and Clark were looking for men to fulfill a variety of positions. They needed hunters, blacksmiths, carpenters, interpreters, soldiers, and, of course, frontiersmen. Mm -hmm. The hunters would help provide food. The blacksmiths and carpenters would be useful in building and fixing their ships and housing. 
The interpreters would help them communicate with various tribes. The soldiers would provide protection and military expertise. But there were others who also embarked on the journey. Lewis, for example, brought his most loyal companion along. His name was Seaman, and he was a large black Newfoundland dog. Lewis writes about Seaman suffering from all the mosquitoes in a journal entry from 1805. But after this, Seaman is no longer mentioned. This makes many historians believe that Seaman most likely perished at some point during the expedition. Clark himself also brought a companion of sorts, his personal slave, York. Clark grew up with York and inherited him later in life. So while York was a slave, he was also a staple among Clark's family, which made the relationship different than a typical owner-slave dynamic. Clark freed York after 1815 and gave him a wagon and horses for travel. But during the expedition, York deeply fascinated all the local American Indian tribes. That's right. They had never seen a man with such a staggering and muscular physique and dark skin color. Some tribes even believed York had the healing powers of a god and gave him the name Big Medicine. Now, a crew was only one of the many elements needed for the expedition Jefferson envisioned. Training and planning were essential. And Jefferson knew this, so he had Lewis take a six-week course in Philadelphia, learning a variety of skills, but also the practical etiquette of the Indian trade. Basically, the protocol that had been established in the Missouri River Valley. The Missouri River Valley, the great unknown. It was not only a terrain of rivers and valleys, but also jutting mountains and expansive plains. Not to mention a wealth of wildlife, flora and fauna that could be both astounding and deadly. It was a mix of awe and mystery. The dangers that lay ahead were countless, but the biggest danger was actually the smallest foe. Lewis complained about them often in his journals. Mosquitoes. Lewis wrote in one of his summer entries, July 12th. 1805. Mosquitoes extremely troublesome to me today. Of all the animals, grizzly bears, mountain lions, buffalo, snakes, it was the mosquito that harmed him most. But before we pull at that thread, let's embark on the journey that would solidify Lewis and Clark as two of the most influential people in American history. Our vessels consisted of six small canoes and two large pirogues. This little fleet, although not quite so respectable as those of Columbus or Captain Cook, were still viewed by us with as much pleasure as those deservedly famed adventurers ever beheld theirs. And I dare say with quite as much anxiety for their safety and preservation. We're now about to penetrate a country at least 2,000 miles in width, on which the foot of civilized man had never trodden. The good or evil it had in store for us was for experiment yet to determine. And these little vessels contained every article by which we were to expect to subsist or defend ourselves. Lewis's own words early on in the journey, he understood the vastness that lay ahead of him and his crew. But no one could anticipate the power and mercurial nature of the Missouri River itself. The crew navigated the Missouri River in a 45-foot keel boat, which held about 8 tons of equipment and food, but usually only made about 15 miles a day. A good chunk of that equipment was gunpowder, muskets, and lead for making bullets, knives, and tomahawks. The men were prepared for a fight, but luckily the worst it ever got was a small conflict with some Blackfeet Indians in March of 1806. After attempting to steal horses from the crew, two Blackfeets were killed in an altercation. In the summer of 1804, the Corps of Discovery held a council meeting with various American Indian tribes in an area that would become Omaha, Nebraska. Then the crew experienced its first and only fatality. 22-year-old Sergeant Floyd died of appendicitis on August 20th, 1804. There's a monument in his honor in Sioux City, Iowa. During the expedition, Lewis channeled his herbalist mother Lucy's talents, examining the flora with a curious and critical eye. In fact, after entering the Great Plains, the crew witnessed animals never before seen in the East. Over the course of the expedition, 122 animals and 178 plants would be named new species. Some of the animals included the bighorn sheep, mule deer, grizzly bear, prairie dog, and pronghorn antelope. Botanists later named some of the plants in honor of Lewis and Clark. There's Lewisia rediviva, otherwise known as bitterroot and Clarkia pulchella, or Ragged Robin. As for the animals, it was the grizzly bear that left the biggest impression. Lewis describes an encounter that gave the men quite a scare. 
In the evening, the men in two of the rear canoes discovered a large brown bear lying in the open ground, about 300 paces from the river, and six of them went out to attack him. Two of them reserved their fires as had been previously concerted. The four others fired nearly at the same time and put each his bullet through him. In an instant, this monster ran at them with open mouth. The two who had reserved their fires discharged their pieces at him as he came towards them. Both of them struck him, one only slightly, and the other fortunately broke his shoulder. This, however, only retarded his motion for a moment only. The men, unable to reload their guns, took to flight. The bear pursued and had very nearly overtaken them before they reached the river. The men eventually killed the grizzly, but it put up quite the fight. The very real possibility of a bear attack was not the only concern for Lewis and Clark. They worried about how they would be received by the various tribes they met out in the great unknown. It wasn't common, but at one point, there was a tense standoff between Sioux tribe members and the men of the Corps. Bows and arrows were raised, muskets were drawn. It was a four-day ordeal, but thankfully the crisis was averted. The tribe's chief called off the attack. It did, however, signal to Lewis and Clark that they needed to align themselves with other tribes against the Sioux, the powerful tribe which controlled much of the territory. The next big leg of the journey led the Corps of Discovery to Fort Mandan, a central trading hub run by the Mandan tribe. The men stayed here, weathering five months of cold and some unpleasant instances of frostbite. Mm, the temperature remained at about 45 degrees below zero most of the time. It was here that Lewis and Clark met a young Shoshone woman who would become the only female member of the expedition. Her name is pronounced many different ways, but we will refer to her as Sacagawea. Sacagawea had been kidnapped by raiders from the Hidatsa tribe years earlier and brought to the Rocky Mountains. She later became the teenage bride of a French-Canadian trapper named Toussaint Charbonneau, who was paid by Lewis and Clark to serve as an interpreter for the Corps. In actuality, he and Sacagawea were an interpreting team, but Sacagawea was much more fluent considering her heritage. When Lewis and Clark met her, she was about 16 years old. And she was pregnant. Upon seeing Clark, she was amazed by the color of his bright crimson hair and began calling him Red Hair. And while Clark and Sacagawea would develop a friendship over the course of the expedition, it was Lewis who helped her in her most vulnerable moment, the day she gave birth. It was February 11, 1805, three months after she met Lewis and Clark and the Corps set up camp at Fort Mandan. Lewis helped induce a quick labor by crushing up a rattle from a rattlesnake and mixing it in water for Sacagawea to drink. Apparently it did the trick. Sacagawea's son, Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, emerged about 10 minutes later. Sacagawea nicknamed him Pomp, and he would accompany the crew on their journey, bound up and kept close to his mother's chest. It soon became apparent that Sacagawea would be a valuable asset to the crew. One, because she could serve as an interpreter between the men and the varied American Indian tribes. And two, because she had been captured and brought across the unfamiliar terrain, she knew the routes to take and how to survive on the land. She showed the men edible plants and roots. On one occasion, when a boat overturned in the river, she rescued many of their possessions. She became such an important part of the expedition, the men honored her by naming a river after her. Lewis wrote, May 20th, 1805. The hunters returned this evening and informed us that the country continued much the same in appearance as that we saw where we were, and that about five miles above the mouth of Shell River, a handsome river of about 50 yards in width, discharged itself into the Shell River on the Stard, or upper side. This stream we called Sacagawea, or Bird Woman's River, after our interpreter. Sacagawea would continue to become even more of a value to the expedition, and the men realized this. Clark alludes to this at one point in his journal, explaining that they came in contact with many different tribes, but most remained amicable. He believed this was because of Sacagawea's presence among them, stating, quote, We find reconciles all the Indians as to our friendly intentions. A woman with a party of men is a token of peace. End quote. There was a level of admiration and understanding that Clark had for Sacagawea, which was rare, considering at the time both women and American Indians weren't considered equal to white men. 
In other words, Sacagawea and her young baby in tow signaled to the tribes the peaceful intentions of Lewis and Clark and their crew of frontiersmen, and they respected her for it. This gave Lewis and Clark a sense of ease when meeting new tribes, but the arduous journey itself tested every man daily. And generated the need for extreme sustenance. To survive and maintain their strength, the men ate about nine pounds of meat per person each day when they could, mostly elk and bison. The amount of meat is equivalent to about 24 to 25 hamburgers a day. They needed all the protein they could get to keep them energized for the level of manual labor and physical activity the challenges of the journey required, not to mention the cold. Wow, eating all that meat is probably why they required a homemade medicine nicknamed Rush's Thunderbolts. These were strong laxatives made by Dr. Benjamin Rush, and 600 doses were included in the expedition's supplies. Well, most of the crew even took to eating dogs they purchased from tribes when the availability of meat was scarce. But apparently, Clark and Sacagawea refused. Mm, I would have too. Well, that's what you say now, but desperate times call for desperate measures. Until August, after leaving Fort Mandan in April of 1805, the Corps of Discovery saw no American Indian tribes on the land, which was rare. It made Lewis and Clark wonder where they were. Had Sacagawea led the men astray by accident? The co-leaders were in a bit of a panic and at a standstill until a Shoshone tribe came upon them. Sacagawea began to interpret. When she looked at the chief of the tribe, his name was Kamehawait. When Sacagawea saw him clearly, she began to weep. It was her brother, from whom she had been separated when she was just a child. It was a beautiful reunion, but Kamehawait decided to stay with his tribe rather than join the expedition. So the siblings were once again separated. With the tribe's guidance and a supply of horses, the Corps, with Sacagawea still serving as an aide, eventually reached the head of the Missouri River. This was great progress, but the crew still needed to find a passage to the Pacific Ocean, per President Jefferson's instructions. So the men continued on, stalwart and unceasing as ever. A year and a half after the journey began, the men finally laid eyes on what they had been searching for all along, the great Pacific Ocean. While on their six-month return trip home, the Corps of Discovery celebrated with alcohol they had received from fur traders. Clark wrote, quote, Our party received a dram and sung songs until 11 o'clock at night in the greatest harmony. End quote. On September 23, 1806, the Corps of Discovery returned to great fanfare and a thrilled president. The crew survived and accomplished most, if not all, of what it set out to do, with only one unfortunate fatality. In other words, it could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. But the men did have to contend with various ailments, such as frostbite and syphilis. They also experienced malaria, dysentery, and sore eyes, which was probably caused by sand in the air or sunlight reflecting off water and snow. But considering what they were undertaking, it's nearly a miracle that they were able to return fairly unscathed. So what exactly did the mission accomplish? Well, the men established a route for commerce, opening a huge door for the United States in their new territory. Lewis, the mission's gallant leader, has been called undoubtedly the greatest pathfinder this country has ever known. Not only did he co-lead the crew, but he also made advances in the fields of botany and anthropology, discovering new species of plants and writing about the various tribes the Corps of Discovery came in contact with. Clark served as a pillar of strength for Lewis when he needed it, but he also ended up drawing a completely new and accurate map of the American West. Which was an incredible accomplishment. And both men documented their experiences. Their daily accounts were finally published and came to be known as the Journals of Lewis and Clark. On January 15, 1807, in a message to the U.S. Secretary of War, Meriwether Lewis praised the men who accompanied him on the journey. With respect to all those persons whose names are entered on this roll, I feel a peculiar pleasure in declaring that the ample support which they gave me under every difficulty, the manly firmness which they evinced on every necessary occasion, and the patience and fortitude with which they submitted to and bore the fatigues and painful sufferings incident to my late tour to the Pacific Ocean, entitles them to my warmest approbation and thanks. Nor will I suppress the expression of a hope 
that the recollection of services thus faithfully performed will meet a just reward and an ample remuneration on the party of our government. Besides the acclaim, each man received concrete rewards, including 320 acres of land. Lewis and Clark each received 1,600 acres of land for serving as the mission's leaders. President Jefferson then appointed Lewis governor of Louisiana. But this wasn't the smartest of moves. Mm, Because Lewis was not a politician, and the job became quite stressful for him. He ended up in several land disputes and started drinking heavily. But that's not all. Lewis had contracted malaria while on the expedition. Mm, Remember all those pesky mosquitoes? So upon his return, he began self-medicating, regularly taking a strong concoction of opium and morphine. He was also facing debts and hounding creditors. He eventually became very depressed and even suicidal. Apparently, this depression was nothing new to Lewis. According to historian Stephen Ambrose, Lewis actually tried to kill himself while on the expedition, but was restrained by the crew. Now that you have that context, we can discuss Lewis's death. Which is still fairly controversial. There are two popular theories. One, that he committed suicide. And two, that he was murdered. Three years after the expedition ended, Lewis was traveling from New Orleans to Washington, D.C. to see President Jefferson and discuss the publishing of the journals. In October of 1809, Lewis stopped at Grinder's Inn in Natchez Trace, Tennessee. Where he was found dead from bullet wounds to the head and abdomen. A man by the name of James Neely, a federal agent to the Chickasaw Indians, who offered to guide Lewis to Nashville and then onward, wrote to President Jefferson, quote, Sir, it is with extreme pain that I have to inform you of the death of His Excellency Meriwether Lewis, Governor of Upper Louisiana, who died on the morning of the 11th, and I am sorry to say, by suicide. End quote. Apparently, no one witnessed the death, and Jefferson accepted this conclusion. But the idea that Lewis was actually murdered soon arose. Historians still debate it to this day. John Geis, editor of By His Own Hand, The Mysterious Death of Meriwether Lewis, claims that murder was the more likely cause and provides a few motives. Geis stated, quote, There were many people in St. Louis who were unhappy with his decisions concerning property and mining rights and money, end quote. So could one of his many debtors have come looking for money and killed him in the process? It's possible. Especially considering Geis goes on to address that Lewis was traveling with a large amount of money. He has stated that, quote, when they inventoried his possessions, there was no mention of any money, end quote. So one theory is that he could have been killed for his money, robbed by some thugs in the area, or like you mentioned, sought out by one or more of his debtors. Although Geis brings up some interesting points, I think for the sake of argument, the consensus has been more in favor of suicide. But it's unlikely we'll ever really know. Regardless of what actually happened... It's a most tragic end for the man who spearheaded the greatest expedition the U.S. has ever known. When Lewis passed away at the age of 35, Clark was grief-stricken. Quote, I fear the weight of his mind has overcome him, end quote. Following Lewis's death, Clark assumed the responsibility of editing and publishing his and Lewis's journal entries. Knowing full well that he was not up to the task, Clark convinced Nicholas Biddle to take the reins instead. But Clark did help facilitate the publication of the book, which hit the shelves in 1814. And in contrast to Lewis, Clark had a very different experience once he returned home. He married Julia Hancock in January of 1808. Apparently his choice to name a river after her during the expedition helped seal the deal. The couple ended up having five children together. Clark named his firstborn son Meriwether after his friend. Clark then remarried after his first wife died and added more children to his pack. But that's not all. In 1812, after Sacagawea died at the age of 24, Clark adopted her eight-year-old son, Pomp, and Sacagawea's second child, a daughter named Lisette. Clark took great care of them both and even paid for Pomp's education. In 1815, Clark became governor of the Missouri Territory and served as the superintendent of Indian Affairs. This meant he helped settle disputes between American Indian tribes and white settlers and craft treaties to keep the peace. Clark died of natural causes at the age of 68. This was almost unheard of. The average life expectancy of a person at that time was only 37 years. Wow. So Clark had a considerably long life for the time period. Mm -hmm. He was able to look back on his accomplishments for years. He, with his dear friend Meriwether Lewis, 
commandeered an expedition that took 863 days. They led a crew across 7,689 miles. The original cost of the expedition, which was approved by Congress, was $2,500. By the end of the expedition, the cost was $38,722, which would be over $700,000 today. But it was well worth it. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark blazed a new path for their nation, allowing for expansion, trade, and ultimately an entirely new future. And you can't really put a price tag on that, can you? Thank you for joining us for another episode of Historical Figures. A new episode comes out every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe to Historical Figures on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, or your favorite podcast directory. And while you're at it, leave us a five-star review. Mm -hmm. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network, or through our website, Parcast.com. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. As always, we thank you for listening. Historical Figures was created by Max Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Carrie Murphy and Joel Stein. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Historical Figures is written by Jessica Mallow and stars Vanessa Richardson and Carter Roy. Our amazing cast of voice actors are, in alphabetical order, Steve Pinto and Greg Polson. 